What's up, everybody? All right, so today we're going to be talking about day trading terminology, and the term of the day is the five cent tick pilot program. Now, whether you're a day trader, a swing trader, or an investor, it's really important for you to understand the ins and outs of this program. This could affect some of the stocks you're trading, and if you're not aware of it, you're really going to be at a disadvantage when you pull up one of those stocks and you try to take a position because they're going to look a little bit different. This is actually the first time in over 15 years that the SEC is changing uh, the bid-ask spread. Now, as many of you know, in 2001, uh, we went through decimalization. Prior to that, the market traded in fractions. And so uh, the minimum spread, the smallest spread we could possibly have was 1 16th, which is 6.25 cents. Now, when we went through decimalization, all of a sudden the minimum spread became one penny. Right? Stocks right now trade uh, in, in a minimum of a one penny spread. You'll never see a spread smaller than a penny except for stocks that are trading uh, below a dollar. All right, so this is a stock here trading, uh, it should be trading 425 by 426. All right, this is like a false order, but that's a one, spe one cent spread. Now, uh, this five cent tick pilot program is changing the minimum spread from one penny back up to five cents. All right, so that's a pretty big deal. Now, um, on April 9th, 2001, uh, all stocks trading above $1 were required to begin trading with one cent increments, right? So meaning stocks that uh, were trading at, you know, at an eighth or trading at a 16th, uh, they now had increments at every penny uh, between the whole dollar. So from $1 to $2, that's 100 increments, right? When you think of all the places you could have an order. So previously it was only, you know, eight or 16, depending on how the stock traded. So that represented a 600 to 1,000% increase in the number of price points where traders could place their orders between each whole dollar. All right, now there's uh, several theories about what drove lawmakers and regulators to support the shift to decimalization. And the first belief was that since the US market was the only stock exchange at the time not trading in decimals, that the move to decimals would make the market easier and more attractive for foreign investment, right? Easier to understand the pricing. You know, if we, if right now I went to go trade on a market that was fractions, it would be pretty confusing. So if we want to attract foreign investment, you know, that was, that was one theory. Uh, the second belief was that uh, decimalization would bring more trading volume into the market. That would increase liquidity and improve trading for investors. All right. Now uh, in the 15 years since decimalization, uh, traders and investors are reflecting back on the impact of that uh, historical shift to a minimum spread of one penny. Uh, Greg uh, Godsey, the head of uh, 360 Wealth Management, uh, he said, quote, in my opinion, decimalization is a negative because it narrowed the spreads. And on the surface, you would think that would be better for the markets, but narrower spreads mean less profit for market makers and less profit leads to less capital and less capital leads to less liquidity, which is really interesting. So a market maker, a market maker's job is to sit on both the bid and the ask. So we can pull up a stock. Um, let's see. Let's just look at um, DRYS, for instance, one that has a, probably a better spread. So here you've got EdgeX and EdgeX is a market maker sitting on both the bid and the ask. All right. He's on both sides. He's making the market. And these market makers create the spread and they profit by trading across the spread. All right. So when you have a bigger spread, there's more opportunity for profit. Right. A five cent spread with 10,000 shares is five hundred dollars. So every time they move 10,000 shares, that's five hundred dollars profit. But with a one cent spread, well, that's only one hundred dollars. So the profits go down to the point, uh, and this is the, the theory, to the point that some market makers have lost the incentive to even make the market on these types of stocks. So what does that mean? That means uh, less of the big institutions, less of the market makers are holding positions of these stocks. Um, they're in turn less likely to uh, issue reports, research reports, uh, you know, price analysis, uh, upgrades, downgrades, you know, stuff like that. They're less likely, maybe, to have investors come in and take large positions. And so uh, all of this uh, concern was based on Congress uh, being worried about 
the small cap market. And, and really uh, also concerned about IPOs, because isn't the goal that a stock comes into the market as a small cap, at IPOs as a small cap, and then grows and grows and grows. A lot of the big companies started at very low prices. You think of Apple and some of the others, and then they've grown to some of the largest stocks on the market. So, you know, we certainly want to continue to see that, um, you know, that trend. And that's why in 2011, a group of professionals known as the IPO Task Force released a report that sharply criticized decimalization. It stated, quote, the adoption of decimal pricing, wherein stocks are priced in pennies instead of by fractions of dollars, by 2001, further reduced the economic opportunity per trade for investment banks, right? And it's kind of funny, like as if, as if the retail traders really care about what's good for investment banks. But, uh, you know, this is sort of that trickle-down theory that if it's not good for them, they're not going to be investing in these small stocks, and then, you know, there's less opportunity for growth. In, and I continue here, and this quote, in the new low-cost, frictionless environment promulgated by electronic trading and decimalization, investment banks now generate revenue primarily by executing high volume of low-priced trades meant to capitalize on short-term changes in the price of highly liquid, very large cap stocks. All right, so let's let's kind of break that down. Uh, you know, this is um, that might be a little confusing. So, in other words, market makers are less likely. This suggests to trade small cap stocks, and they're more likely to trade large cap stocks, uh, such as a stock like Siri. All right, this is a stock where uh, you've got 200,000 shares on the bid, 200,000 shares on the ask. And these shares crossing the bid and ask all day long, it's $100 each time, $100, $100, $100. This is fairly safe. Look at, I mean, realistically, look at the volatility here. Even with 100,000 shares, you're just not seeing that much movement. This stock pretty much just goes sideways. This is the type of stock uh, that a market maker is going to profit on with high frequency trading. And a stock like, um, let's just say, for example, DRYS or or GLBS, an even uh, more thinly traded stock, there aren't very many market makers trading this stock, right? So the result is that this is not a very liquid stock. It would be hard to get into this stock and get out of it with size, meaning that if there was an investor who actually wanted to take a position, you, he probably wouldn't be able to buy 50,000 shares of this without it making a really giant move. And that's because there's not market makers providing the market for that type of liquidity. So the long and the short of it is that um, in this uh, IPO task force report in 2011, uh, you know, they made note of the fact that Apple, Cisco, FedEx, and Starbucks all entered the market with an IPO as a small cap stock, small and mid cap companies that have since grown to become some of the largest uh, companies on the market. So uh, the task force suggests that decimalization has made for a less than favorable environment for small cap stocks because market makers and investment banks don't profit from the spread the way they used to. And as a result, they're less inclined to provide or make the market on those stocks, support their IPOs, or conduct research on these emerging, emerging companies. All right, so uh, evidence to support that theory was the fact that the number of IPOs between 2001 and 2011 had dropped sharply uh, versus the 10 years uh, prior. All right, so uh, in 2012, now, uh, the Jumpstart Our Business Startups, the Jobs Act, required in Section 106 that the SEC issue a report on the impact of decimalization and, in particular, its impact on IPOs. All right, now, you guys probably didn't know this. Uh, so this was actually uh, mandated that the SEC had to issue this report. And in this report, uh, the SEC directly responded to the IPO task force report. And at the end of their 27-page uh, report, they concluded uh, the impact of man mandating an increase in the minimum tick size for small capitalization companies on the structure of our markets and on the willingness of small companies to undertake initial public offerings is, at best, uncertain. Although mandating an increase in tick size to levels greater than those uh, presently dictated by market forces may provide more incentives to market makers in certain stocks, 
the full impact of such a change, including whether or not an increase in tick size would indeed result in more IPOs and whether there would be a significant negative or unintended consequence is difficult to ascertain. That was their report to Congress. So the commission determined that they should not make a change at that time uh, from the minimum one cent spread on all stocks over a dollar. Well, in 2014, despite that 2012 report, a 2014 bill by the House of Representatives required the SEC to implement a two-year-long pilot program to test the impact of a larger minimum spread. Lawmakers and regulators, um, again, are hypothesizing that increasing the minimum spread will create incentives for brokers and investment bakers uh, to make the markets on small cap stocks. And this in turn will make them more likely to support the IPOs, issue research reports, and actively invest in small cap markets. So this pilot program that we're seeing right now uh, will also examine whether a larger spread will increase liquidity, reduce volatility, and result in sustainable long-term growth in small cap stocks. Now, some of the opponents of the tick size pilot program argue that increasing the minimum spread will result actually in greater risk for investors, increased uh, complexity in the exchange, and higher commission costs. Greenwich Associates conducted a survey of institutional traders and found that only 4% believe uh, increased capital formation opportunities for emerging growth companies um, will be the result of the uh, five cent spread. In addition, only 9% believe it will actually improve liquidities, uh, liquidity in those securities. All right, so um, this is kind of where we're at right now. Forced to comply, the SEC and FINRA worked with market makers and the investment banks uh, over the course of two years, from 2014 to 2016, to build out the framework and the technology to create the five cent spread. So now, two years later, here we are at the end of 2016, um, the, on October 3rd, uh, the five cent tick program is launched. All right, and now for the first time in over 15 years, the minimum tick size has changed for approximately uh, 1,200 stocks that are um, part of the tick size pilot program. All right, so these stocks now trade with a minimum of a five cent spread. So remember how we were looking at Siri before. This is a stock that trades with a one cent spread, uh, but trades very, very thickly. It, it really doesn't move. Well, let's look at the float. The float of this stock is 3.79 billion shares with a 21 billion share mark, 21 million dollar, sorry, 21 billion dollar market cap. So this is a very thickly traded stock. Let's look at another one that trades uh, pretty thickly. Bank of America, 10 billion share float, $227 billion market cap. Uh, another one, um, Sprint, $33 billion market cap, float of 2.79 billion shares. And we can look at Sprint. These stocks, they don't move. So these are the types of stocks that, uh, and actually this one's been a little bit more volatile, but for the most part, these stocks really don't make big moves. We're talking about a 10 cent range. So as a result, these are the ones that are more popular among the uh, investment bankers and you know, the, the market makers, high frequency traders, because they're so liquid. They can shift 10,000 shares uh, you know, every couple seconds from one side to another, and it's not going to affect the liquidity. You could literally come in here and buy a million dollars worth of stock, and it wouldn't move a penny. If you tried to do the same thing on GLBS, this stock would probably drop you know, if you tried to sell a million dollars worth of stock, this thing would probably drop like a point and a half because there's no liquidity. There's no one there to absorb uh, that type of, of sell order. All right. And that's obviously that does increase risk for for investors, someone who does want to buy a really large position. It would it would be really hard. So, you know, I understand that. But here's the thing uh, with the five cent tick um, stocks that previously traded sort of the way GLBS trades now trade like this. Look at that. Look at how similar that is to Sprint or to Siri, right? Now it starts to look the same. All right. Well, here's the reason. By implementing a five cent spread, there will now be only 20 price points between each whole dollar, right? So when there were 100, you could put an order, let's say at 401, 402, 403, 404, et cetera, all the way up to 4.99 and five dollars. That's a hundred price points where you can place orders. Well, now we just pulled out 80% of those price points, and there's only 20 left, and they're at every five cent increment. 
So they're now priced, um, we'll go to ship. You'll see here on the level two, everything is in fives. Uh, it'll either be on the dime or on the nickel. So 120, 125, 130, 135, et cetera. Here's another one, DPRX. Uh, everything is going to be uh, priced on the nickel. All right, so the dime and the nickel. Now, this means uh, when you remove 80% of the price points, all of the buyers and sellers are forced into these little trenches, right? And so everyone groups together in these trenches, right, at the nickel and the, and the dime. So you now have a lot more liquidity, and you do. You could get into this with 20,000 shares now, where in the past uh, that stock might have traded like GLBS, and you simply wouldn't have been able to. You can see here, you've got 1,000 shares at 510, 200 at 518, zero at 522, and 100 shares at 535. This could move up to 535 in almost a heartbeat. Siri, on the other hand, obviously can't even move up to you know, 555 in a heartbeat. And now ship a similar stock uh, because of the 5 cent tick. This, even to move 10 cents, would require a tremendous amount of volume. And so what's really interesting is that uh, ship is a fairly low float stock. And I'll pull up my, um, let's see, my um, report here. So let's see, what is ship at? Now ship looks on the level two, just like Sprint, but it's actually only a 13 million share float with a market cap of just 40 million shares. So it is a fraction of the size, but now it's trading in almost the same way. So if you have a trader now with a 20, 30,000 share position, he can sell here onto the market and it will be executed instantly. He probably won't get any slippage because there's a lot more liquidity. So during these uh, two years, this will sort of be the test. Does this actually increase uh, IPOs? Does it increase uh, investment bankers and market makers to be engaged in these stocks, uh, putting out research reports and taking investments? Um, does it reduce volatility and make for a more favorable environment uh, for investors? And you know, the priority here is not what's good for traders. Day traders profit from volatility, but really what's good for investors and, and what's good for long-term um, you know, the success of these small, small cap stocks. Okay, so uh, in the pilot program, uh, the, the stocks affected are split into groups. The first group contains about 200 stocks, and this is considered uh, the control group. And these stocks will continue to trade at one cent spreads. Uh, the first test group will be quoted in five cent increments, but will continue to trade at their current increments. So it'll be quoted at five cent increments, but trades can go through between the spread. Uh, the second test group will be quoted at five cent increments, uh, but will allow certain exceptions, including midpoint trades for retail investor executions. So that group uh, will only allow midpoint trades. So a trade, I guess, at um, 122.5. Uh, the third test group will be quoted at five cent increments and traded at five cent increments uh, and will follow the, the same requirements of the second group. Uh, which will allow midpoints, but will also be subject to a trade at requirement, um, which is something that is detailed in the FINRA on the FINRA website. All right. So essentially, these stocks right now uh, for the next two years that are trading in five cent increments look like this. So when I see a stock, uh, and this is today is a good example, and it's why I wanted to do this video. I saw DPRX as the leading gapper, gapping up 65% with a 5.47 million share float. It's a low float stock. This is the type of stock that in the past, uh, like DRYS. DRYS, look at how this stock moved. This stock went from uh, literally $4 to over $100 in four trading days. That was an incredible opportunity for traders. But this type of volatility may not be favorable for investors. It's really hard to invest in stocks that could do this type of thing because it could just it could just catch you so off guard. And it, as quick as it went up, it came all the way back down. So, you know, here's a stock like DPRX that is similar in the float. And we might think on uh, another day, or if this was a, um, a different, sorry, DP, DPRX, on another day with a stock not affected by the pilot program, it's the type that could potentially move up uh, quite a bit. We could easily see a 20, 30, 40% move. But today, the biggest move was pre-market when the uh, liquidity was lower. And then as soon as the bell rang, 
we just sold off. So you can see here, uh, at this point, the market makers are really able to control the stock. In a lot of ways, they're able to control the stock. And that's going to be a problem for retail traders, for day traders, and for swing traders. For investors that are looking at the fundamentals over the long term of 3, 6, 12 months, uh, this is not going to have as much of an impact because the positions are such a different time frame. But for short-term traders, this is really um, decreasing our ability to profit because we are seeing, as a result, less volatility. All right, and that's an important thing to understand. So, uh, you know, right now, uh, the initial reaction to the, uh, you know, the tick size pilot program among traders is that it is in fact reducing volatility among small caps and thereby it is achieving one of the goals of the program. So a stock like DPRX that formerly might have squeezed up 20, 30 percent or even more, you know, now appears pretty much pegged at the same price, especially after a period of, you know, a couple hours just consolidating. And this is a time frame when the market makers can start to profit, right? Now they can just move this move across that five cent spread and, and they can generate a profit. So uh, they are really trading a lot, uh, a lot like these large cap stocks like Sprint, which of course has lots of market makers, lots of institutional traders, lots of research analysis, lots of opinion, all that stuff. And, uh, you know, obviously Sprint is, I suppose, making its way out of the small caps. I mean, slowly, but it is making its way. It's up over the last year about, uh, you know, looks like it's doubled from $3, well, almost tripled up to $9. So this is the type of thing I think, uh, you know, that Congress and lawmakers are thinking is what you want to see small caps doing. So have them IPO. Of course, this has been around for a long time, but have them IPO, have them start, uh, you know, attracting retail investors, attracting uh, institutional investors and grow from a small cap up into a mid cap and a large cap stock. And will the tick size pilot program uh, help in that, you know, in that goal, maybe it will, and it will change the way we look at some of the small cap stocks. So what it may do is it may force us to start trading stocks um, that are not going to be affected by this, um, uh, by this program. All right. So stocks that are a slightly higher price, but are still really volatile. So how would we find those stocks? Well, the easiest way to do it is to create a simple scanner. Now I can go in here, uh, go into advanced. This is trade ideas, uh, trade ideas software that I'm using. And you know, this isn't something that we really need to worry about now. And again, we're in, we're at 2016. Uh, it was 2012 when Congress, uh, or the house of representatives, uh, required that the, um, the SEC do this two year long program. It took them two years to figure out how they would do it. Now we're starting it here. It'll finish in 2018. And then who knows how long it would take if they decide to actually implement something across the whole market. It could take another you know, year or two, who knows? So this is not something we really need to worry about immediately, but it does also show the value of being able to diversify your strategies. The good thing about trading is that once you understand chart patterns, you can apply them to any stock of any price range. The reason I like trading small cap stocks is because right now they are so popular among retail investors and stocks like Sprint and Bank of America are not. Retail traders don't trade this type of stuff. All right. So if there ends up being a change where small caps trade like Sprint and, uh, and Bank of America, then all retail traders most likely will switch to a different area of the market whether it's um, you know, the stocks priced between $20 and $30 that start to get a lot of attention, I'm not sure. But you can, you can bet that retail traders will find another area of the market for volatility. All right, so just to create a simple scan here, we could go in um, and we could say, you know, we're going to look at stocks. Um, if we know, for instance, that um, the mar they're going to be a applying this to a certain market cap, we can go and create a market cap filter to only look for stocks that have a market cap of over, let's say, 100 million shares, $100 million. Um, all right, so market cap of $100 million. And then we could say, um, you know, we only want to look at stocks priced above $10. And then we only want to look at stocks that are volatile, that, that actually move. The best way to do that is to use average true range. So we can go and we can add this. I could say I, I want a minimum average true range of, you know, let's just say 50, 50 cents a day, and that's probably setting it low. All right, so 
here we can call this um, high ATR one cent spread stocks. And then here you can start sorting based on the float if you wanted to, or you could start full, if it's based on um, market cap, you'll still have some low float stocks, or you could, uh, you could sort by average true range. You gotta go in here to configure, uh, advanced and add the column. So let's just add the column for ATR. Move that over there, say okay, okay. And now if I stretch this out here, we'll see ATR. So I can look now at the stocks that have large ATRs and maybe I wanna put a price cap so I'm not seeing stocks that expensive, but here's a stock blue, for instance. It's got a $4 ATR, which is a pretty big ATR for a $60 stock. So this one's gonna to continue to trade, most likely in one cent spreads. I mean, unless they change what the thresholds are and I just put in a hundred million, but uh, you know, this is a stock that here you have, you know, your bull flag and that's a bull flag breakout. So the reason these patterns work is because thousands and thousands of traders are buying at the breakout point because they know these are the types of stocks that provide the biggest opportunities for profit. So, you know, my, my thought is that if small caps, for whatever reason, because this in 2018, 2019, 2020 uh, turned into five cent spread, then I would imagine all retail traders will start focusing on you know stocks that are volatile and still provide opportunities. So stocks like Blue would start getting better follow through. AGIO here, uh, this one's forty dollar stock. Again, a lot of range between forty two there and forty two sixty eight. So these patterns right now, they don't get as much follow through because traders generally prefer to trade the lower price stocks. They're more profitable. But, you know, if that changes, the market changes, then we'll see traders shift. And uh, they may shift to the OTC market or to penny stocks, but I hope they don't. I, I hope that retail traders um, stay on NYSE and NASDAQ and just look at the higher priced options. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to get into OC OTC stuff. At least I, I hope I don't have to. I hope that uh, we'll still see opportunities here. And I think we will. I, we already have some, and I think they'll just continue to get better. All right. So um, at this point right now, uh, in 2000, in the spring of 2018, uh, the SEC uh, will be, in April uh, of 2018, uh, issuing a report on their findings. So this is something that day traders, swing traders, and investors, market makers, regulators, investment bankers, and lawmakers will all be uh, eagerly awaiting. All right. So, uh, you know, we'll see. I mean, the whole idea here with the 2012 Jobs Act was to create more jobs, was to help small companies uh, to have more IPOs uh, and more benefit from investment and stuff like that. So this is, uh, you know, when you think about the big picture, this is for the economic good of, uh, you know, the, this, uh, you know, I suppose country and, and all stocks on this market. So, we just have to adjust as traders. And of course, in 2001, all traders had to adjust when everything changed from fractions to decimals. So this is part of the life of being a trader. You do have to adjust. There are going to be times where there are things that are just outside our control. So uh, for the next two years, I want you guys to make sure you know how to identify stocks with the five cent spread. Easiest way is to pull up the level two. Uh, and look, if you only see quotes at nickels and dimes, there's a good chance this stock is a five cent spread, right? Five cent tick. So I would probably say I'm not going to trade it. These ones are not easy to day trade. And that's the easiest way to do it. Just look at the level two. And if that's what you see, then, uh, then you'll skip on the trade. And that also exemplifies the importance of using level two to be able to see these types of things. Because if you're not using this as a tool, then you really are trading almost with one eye closed. So uh, if you don't know how to use level two, we've got another video, day trading terminology, level two that you guys can check out. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to put comments below. I'm happy to answer them. And I hope you guys all um, trade safe and trade smart. All right, guys, I'll talk to you soon. Let's be honest. If you made it this far, you must have really enjoyed that video. So what's stopping you? Subscribe right here and get email alerts anytime I upload new content. Until then, happy surfing.